take your Bibles and open them to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. This evening we're going to be looking at an example from Jesus' ministry uh, where a man came with, uh, with a true heart of faith to Christ. And as uh, Brother Zach mentioned in his prayer, uh, talk about the, the miracle of uh, transformation in his life. Not so much uh, externally, but internally, as we evaluate uh, the heart that he came to Christ with and um, what happened as a result. Now, we've been studying for some time on Wednesday nights on the topic of, fra- of faith, excuse me, and this lesson is going to springboard off of that somewhat unintentionally as we look at this example real time. Uh, this message has been in the back of my mind for some time already. But I'm glad that it already ties in with a topic that we've already been studying on. We don't have much of a break between um, what pastors have been teaching on on Wednesday nights. Mark chapter 2 and verses 1 through 12 are going to be our passage of scripture for tonight. So if you're over there, please turn with it, uh, turn to it with me. I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. It says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, speaking of Jesus, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And there come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, Or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. If he would, let's uh, go before the Lord once more and ask for his blessing on this time. Father, we're grateful to be in your house and grateful to be with your people. Pray that you would be with us during this time as we know you are, that you would uh, continue to work in people's hearts as your truth is preached tonight. And Lord, uh, pray that you'd give me the, the boldness and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the opportunity to preach truth uh, to these people. It's a blessing to be here tonight and with your people. And we ask that you would uh, continue to to be with those that can't be here. I ask that you would bless them and I pray that they would walk closely with you and that you would find every heart and mind uh, attuned to your word and that you'd find us uh, expectant uh, to see how you might work in our lives this evening. And all these things we pray, amen. All right. Now, by way of introduction, this passage finds Jesus in the city of Capernaum in verse 1. And to set the context for what we're going to be studying on tonight, this is the second time we read about Capernaum in the book of Mark. In chapter 1, verses 21 through 34, we read about Capernaum. When Jesus came, he taught in the synagogue there, and there was a man with a devil, and Jesus cast the devil out of that man. And then this devil confirmed that Jesus was the Holy One of God. Jesus then went and he healed Simon's mother-in-law in in the same city. And then it says that Jesus rose up the next day and went out to pray in the desert. And then to cap it off, it says in verse 37, And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And Jesus responded that they were going to go out and they were going to preach elsewhere. Um, And so at the beginning of chapter 2, it says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Presumably, and this is presumption on our part, but um, this might have been the same house they stayed in last time, probably Peter's house. Um, And it was Peter's mother that, or mother-in-law that Jesus had healed in chapter 1. We don't know how long it was between times when Jesus was in Capernaum, between chapter 1 and chapter 2, but we do know that he was preaching around the Sea of Galilee, and he was teaching in the villages and in the desert. And so uh, we can rightly 
deduce that the people were aware of who Jesus was and the work that he continued to do, not just in Capernaum, but in the surrounding towns. And remember that faith is always well informed in truth, and so um, this interaction we see between Jesus and the man with the palsy was not a, uh, wasn't a happenstance situation, spur of the moment. Uh, Jesus continued to teach the word of God. He had already made quite the impact in this town already by healing many people of their diseases and their ailments and casting out devils. And so uh, this man and, and really the, this group of men had some knowledge of Christ. Uh, and some, maybe they had heard him before, we don't know. But we do know that they had heard what Jesus taught and what he did. And they came to him in the right heart of faith. And that's really what we want to dig into for tonight. That's the main thought that I'm going to bring the main thought we're going to flesh out is what a true heart of faith really looks like. And so I have four very simple points for you right out of the text here as we look at this example of true faith. And I'm going to come back and reaffirm these as we go along so that you can take notes if you are. You can follow along and you don't get lost in the weeds. Uh, faith is determined. That is the first point for tonight. Faith is always determined. And we see that in verses 1 through 4. It's a deliberate choice. We know that, that one makes to trust and believe in the promises of God's word. We see in verse 2 that Christ preached the word unto them. Christ was teaching the promises of God's word, and these men made a very determined choice to believe in those promises. And the simple dictionary definition of the word determination is firmness of purpose or resoluteness. And when a person is determined, there is no obstacle that will stand in the way of true faith. Now we can ask the question, have you ever been determined, so determined, to reach a goal that nothing would stop you from getting there? People have many goals in life, whether it's work-related or workout-related, or some other hobby or enjoyable pastime. How about when it comes to your relationship with Christ? Luke chapter 13 and verse 24 says, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. And this infers some determination and initiative. I will enter in, and nothing is going to stop me from getting there. And this group of men uh, certainly face some obstacles we see here in this passage as they attempted to reach Jesus. And they're right here in verses 1 through 4. And so if you go back, it says, And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he had preached the word unto them, and they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come to him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they, broke, when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Now, we're going to take a look at a couple of these obstacles, and this will be somewhat of a sub-point to what I'm teaching on already. We see that faith is determined, but the first obstacle that this man faced was the fact that he had palsy. And... He obviously had faith that Jesus could heal him and was determined to get to Christ. We see that. But palsy is a disease that causes paralysis. And it's usually accompanied by some kind of spasming or twitching involuntarily. And it can be brought on by uh, several different things. It can be brought on by some kind of a brain injury or a stroke. And there are different versions of palsy out there in the medical field today. Ultimately, we don't know how this man came to be paralyzed. But the man obviously couldn't move himself. Um, because in verse 3, it tells us that he was born of four. <clears throat> we don't know the extent of his condition. However serious, this didn't stop him from wanting to get to Jesus. Now, his friends responded in kind. They were determined to get him there because he obviously couldn't do it himself. And so they threw him on a stretcher and they brought him to Jesus. And then the second obstacle that was faced was actually getting into the house to see Jesus. Because we see that uh, in verse 2, there were many that were gathered together. Uh, in so much that there was no room to receive them, not, not so much as about the door. So the house was packed out. There's no way they're getting in, can't get to Jesus. What is the option left? Now, from a little bit of study on the construction of how Israel, or Israelites built their houses, we know that they had a flat type of roof, and there was a parapet or a battlement around the top so that people couldn't fall off the roof when they were standing up there, according to Deuteronomy 22.8. Um, that incurred um, blood on your head in God's eyes. And so he told the people to build a parapet or build a battlement on top of the roof so that um, 
if you were, whatever you were doing up there, you wouldn't fall off the roof. Now, this did not deter this group of men at all. We can see that they didn't really care that the house was full, and they didn't really care that Jesus was busy. They were going to create their own door to get to Jesus. And so, in their determination to get to Jesus, <laughs> kind of humorous, but um, they crawled up onto the roof, they drug the paralyzed man with them, and then they literally broke the roof apart to get to Jesus. <laughs> Uh, it says, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. So this isn't your, your typical mud hut. It was pretty much stone and brick, and so you had to bust your way through the top of it. In the middle of what's going on, Jesus is teaching in the house. And so if you can picture the mental, the mental image of what's happening, um, we'll, we'll get into that. There are always obstacles that stand in the way of faith. And so we can take some, some very practical applications out of at least the very first four verses that we see here. Um, now, for people that are saved here, perhaps you remember some of, uh, some of the obstacles you, you faced before you got saved. Uh, and for those who are not saved, that are here, what kind of obstacles do you face in your own life before you can come to Christ in true faith? Now, there's always going to be obstacles, usually our own sin, our lack of submission to Christ, or lack of submission to the truth of God's word. Um, maybe you're ambivalent. Maybe you don't really see your sin as all that bad. This is an obstacle. Maybe you think that God couldn't save a person like you. This is an obstacle. And maybe you doubt that you'll really be saved. You're afraid of making uh, a false profession of faith. Once again, this is an obstacle. Ultimately, uh, our own sin is the greatest obstacle to coming to God in faith. And... <laughs> the list of excuses goes on. Now, the question I would like to ask is, are you going to make an absolute choice like these men did to overcome these obstacles, or are you going to let them prevent you to, from getting to Christ and having a relationship with Him? Now, I'm not talking about works for salvation, and I hope that's evident, but I'm talking about a determination, a determination, mind you, to come to Christ and submit yourself to His help, uh, and healing power in your life despite your own sin or the influences of other people or even life circumstances that might prevent you. Even after salvation, there's still obstacles one has to overcome. One faces obstacles in their walk with God. But the difference there is there ought to be a quiet submission and a rest in God to overcome those obstacles. And so the first point we can see is that faith is determined from verses 1 through 4. And the second, the second point we can see is that true faith is rewarded. True faith is rewarded. Now, how would you feel if someone crawled up onto your roof because they couldn't get inside, tore your roof apart, and then dropped into your living room while you were teaching a Bible study? Presumably this could have been Peter's house. What do you think Peter thought about that? Probably not super excited. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. The question we ought to be asking is, what was Jesus' response to this ordeal? Now, uh, he was the son of God, and he could see people's hearts, and he could see people's minds, but he recognized true faith when he saw it. And it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, Jesus saw not just the faith of the man with the palsy, but collectively the faith of the whole group. Because we had already talked about there, these men were determined, uh, not just the man who was sick with the palsy, but the men that were bringing them, him there as well. And so, um, you see that they all had the faith that Christ could heal this man. And there are two things to note here. The rewards of true faith that we can see in verse 5 of this passage. There's two things that I'd like to point out to you. The first reward of true faith is that our sins are forgiven. Now, um, just in my own opinion, the greatest phrase that a person could ever hear is found in that verse. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And 1 John 1 and chap or chapter 1 and verse 9 says, if we, forgive, sorry, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When a person is determined to come to Christ, when they strive to enter in, they will be rewarded with forgiveness and with God's mercy. And we know that God is merciful. He's not willing that any should perish. He's always waiting for those who will strive to enter in and come to him in true faith. Salvation is a gift. It's very freely given. You don't have to work for it. He simply waits for those who have 
the determination to come to him in faith and submit themselves. Now, have you approached Christ this way? Have you been so determined to get to Christ that you do whatever it takes and overcome the obstacles preventing you from receiving forgiveness of sins? If you can, or if you have, then you can relate to the other reward of true faith that we see in this verse. And that is, the second reward of true faith is a relationship with God our Father. I never really noticed this uh, before until I was was preparing to to preach this message this past week. He calls the man son. And this is a very personal and loving term. For those who are saved, not only are your sins forgiven, but you also have a relationship with the Father. Now, uh, we talked about this some on Sunday already. When Grandpa was preaching, he gave 17 different terms. He gave us the introduction to soteriology. But he was talking about well, what the blood of Christ has done to and for our sins. right? And some of the words that he used, he talked about how you can be knit together with God because of what Christ has done for us. We were at enmity at one point to God, but now we are in fellowship with him. We were enemies, but now we are reconciled to God. And the relationship has been established based on what Christ has done. Once again, do you have a relationship with the Father today? Psalm 89 verse 26 is God speaking of David, his servant. And God said, He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. You see those two terms used in conjunction with one another. The rock of salvation and Father go hand in hand. It's a very comforting thought to me that God is my heavenly father, that I have an opportunity to walk with him each and every day, that I have a choice uh, to be submitted to him and to his will, and uh, to consistently come and gather together with his people and spend time in God's word. And uh, we have been adopted into God's family as children of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's something that we should always be thankful for. I would also like to note Christ didn't heal the man's physical condition. You see that he said, your sins are forgiven. Right? He didn't say, hey, you're healed. He simply forgave his sins and he brought him into God's family. Now, the man never said a word. He didn't reply with, Jesus, I, I wanted you to get rid of my palsy. I don't, I, you know, thanks, but what are you going to do now? Right? This speaks to the heart of this man and really the condition of his heart. He, he trusted Jesus. He was submitted to Christ's will. Hey, whatever you want, I'm here. The true need of every person's life is not that they would be healed physically. People spend far too much time asking God to heal them physically instead of asking why God has brought this into their life. If God has given you some kind of a physical ailment, accept it and seek to have the right kind of faith. God allows all things for a reason and usually... That reason is to draw you closer to himself if you're not so focused on this temporal life. And perhaps that was the reason for this man having the palsy in the first place, to drive him to understand that he needed a savior, one who could forgive his sins and heal him physically. Now, we can also see that Christ was concerned with the heart. He didn't care about the outward appearance. He wasn't concerned about the man's physical needs right this second. This man had the right kind of faith, And he was humbly willing to come and seek Christ's help. And that teaches us what we should be concerned with as well. Now, members of True North Baptist Church, I'm speaking to you right now. But the heart is always what God addresses through his word. Not the physical things. uh, Not the outward appearance. And when we address people about the gospel, we ought to be dealing with the heart primarily. God can take care of the other things after the heart has been dealt with. And someone comes and submits to Christ. Now, we've seen that faith is determined... And true faith is rewarded. And we're going to look at the third point. True faith is starkly contrasted with false faith. I'll say it again. True faith is starkly contrasted with false faith. And we see that in verses 6 and 7. And verses 6 and 7 show us that there were some there who did not have a true heart of faith. It says, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and reasoning in their hearts, Why did this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now Christ was concerned with the heart and with the faith that this man evidenced in his determination and his obedience to seek him. There are some key characteristics that are shown in the response of the scribes. 
that we ought to be aware of and show some of the dangers of what false faith really looks like. Now, as we look at these characteristics, it gives us a good opportunity for some self-reflection. I would encourage each of us here, speaking to myself as well, like Paul did in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Now, the purpose of Scripture is to edify and to challenge. We should always evaluate ourselves against the examples given in Scripture, whether they're good or whether they're bad, and see if we line up with what God expects of us. That's the purpose of being here tonight. I pray that we would not ever be guilty of responding the way these men did to Christ in this situation. There's a couple of key characteristics, as I mentioned, that we can see in their response. And the first characteristic of, first, or of false faith is that it's distrusting. False, false faith is distrusting. Now, have you ever known anyone who had something negative to say about everything? Have you known someone who doubts Everyone's motives in their heart for doing something or tries to find some kind of a fault or a flaw in everything you do. These people may often be distrusting of everyone and often flaunt that as an excuse for being rude or caustic in their opinions of others. And if you do know someone like this, they're probably exactly like these men here. They're probably just like the scribes. Now, I'd like to point out that distrust starts with a distrust in God and in His Word. And if you don't trust God, you're certainly not going to trust other people. It starts in the heart, just like these men. They sat back and reasoned in their hearts, it says. And that word reason comes from the Greek word, I'm going to try to pronounce it right, dialogizomai. And it means to reckon thoroughly. Now these men were attempting to rectify what Jesus was saying against their own human intellect here. They were approaching Christ with a doubting heart and a doubting mind. And this never results in true faith. It never brings about the right heart of faith. God often works in ways that we don't see and probably wouldn't understand even if we did see them. And this is a very opposite response to true faith, by the way, because it's very easy to see the difference, even if people don't always speak their minds. These men didn't. They were reasoning in their hearts. They didn't say anything outwardly, but they were thinking it. Now the second characteristic of false faith is that it walks by sight. False faith walks by sight. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, a verse that we should be very familiar with by now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The faith of these men who lowered their friend down through the roof was evident. The faith of the man with the palsy was evident. Christ could see it. Now Christ knew their hearts, but it really wasn't all that hard to see if a person was looking for it. You could see the motive and intent of their heart. These men did not see their faith because they were focused on the wrong things. They weren't concerned with the heart. They weren't concerned with the why of doing something. They were more concerned about what was going on. They were worried about what Jesus had said why, rather than the reason why he said it. These men, they knew the Old Testament. They knew what the Old Testament scriptures taught. Yet they missed that the Christ was walking on the earth with them during that very time. They were walking by sight and not by true faith. They were looking for someone who was going to be able to save them from Roman rule, not someone who was going to forgive men of their sins. And false faith is often far too focused on self to trust God's promises. They have to see it for themselves before they're going to believe it. There's no submission involved in this, by the way. Don't be like these men. Trust the word of God. Now, the third characteristic we can see of false faith is pride. Pride is something we should be aware of. Pride is something we should be careful of. Make sure that there's never an ounce of pride in our own hearts and our own minds. Now, religious pride is especially dangerous. It's a key influence of false faith. And this is what they had to say about this. They said, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now, go, don't get me wrong, it was a good question, but the reason they were asking it was wrong. Now, one can forgive sins but God alone, but this was a response of religious pride. They weren't seeking the truth. Do we have religious pride in our lives? If we do, it doesn't come from God. It comes from our own sinful hearts. And the response of false faith says something like this. I know the law. I know what the Bible says. I go to the synagogue. I go to the church. I live to the best of my ability. I hold to God's commands. 
you blasphemer, how dare you try to forgive sins? The word I is in there a lot, and this is the response of a proud person who relies on their own self-righteousness instead of God to forgive sin. The response of the man on the bed was quiet submission. Never said a word. These men were still quiet, yet they were not submitted. Are you this person tonight? Do you respond to God or to others this way? You might not say it out loud, but you might think it in your heart, and that's still just as wrong. Are you relying on yourself, or are you relying on God? Now, this is going to lead us into the final point for today. We've seen from the text here that faith is determined. Faith is rewarded. Faith is always starkly contrasted with false faith. And the final point that we can see from the text here is that true faith brings glory to God. True faith brings glory to God. Ultimately, the quiet, humble submission we see in this man's life, it brought glory to God. This is not true of the scribes who were present. They were quiet, but they weren't humble or submitted. Verses 8 through 12 says this, And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk. But, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Now God knows the heart. That is, that is true. That will always be true. And God knows the heart of every person sitting here tonight, lost or saved. Christ asked a very rhetorical question to the scribes in verse 9. Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. Now you can imagine them sitting there, thinking these things in their hearts. They're not saying it outwardly. And then getting called out in front of everybody for exactly what they were thinking, and Jesus asking them a very simple question like this, and their response probably was something like, Well, yeah, Jesus, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven than to heal a man and have him walk up physically and leave. Now, imagine their surprise when Jesus turned around and healed the man and proved that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And there are several ways that true faith brings glory to God, and I would like to look at those real quick. True faith brings transformation. It brings transformation to every part of life. And while Jesus might have healed the man spiritually, he also healed him physically. It was an outward testimony to the forgiveness of sins in that man's life. That was the emphasis Christ wanted everyone to know that he had the power to forgive sins, that they could come to him in faith, and their sins would be forgiven. And so as we conclude, let's look at some of the principles we see here in this last point. True faith brings transformation internally. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 25 says, A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Now when Jesus forgave this man of his sins, he gave him a new heart as well. God grants a new heart and a new spirit when a person puts their faith in the promises of his word. When he grants forgiveness, he also gives you a new heart that desires to serve him and do what he asks. The affections are changed. The desires are changed. The motives are changed. Priorities are changed. The inward heart responses to God and others are changed. And when a person never really truly repents, and when they don't come to Christ in true faith and humbly submit, God can't give them a new heart. God's desire is that all men, all women, and all children would submit to him so he can give them a new heart, just like this man here who had his sins forgiven. And when a person hears the truth and willingly rebels against it, they're hardened in their heart, and it becomes more and more difficult for God to convict them of sin and bring them to a point of repentance. Now, true faith doesn't stop short of just internal transformation. True faith also brings transformation externally as well. True faith doesn't stop short of action. It's always an active thing because we serve a God of action. 
God sent his son. His son actively taught and called men to repentance, actively forgave men of their sins, actively healed people, and then he actively gave his own life for us on the cross. And none of that was a passive thing. It was an active obedience to the will of God. And it's no different for people who show true faith in their lives and active obedience to the will of God. It starts internally. It starts as a quiet heart submission to God like this man here. But Christ himself said in Luke 6, 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. True faith and obedience in the heart flows out in the action. It can't help but. And you can see this in verses 11 and 12 of our text. Jesus said to him, and that would be the man with the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And the external evidence of the changed heart of this man was obedience. It says in verse 12, And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all. And so immediate obedience is the response of true faith. It doesn't matter there were other people there. It doesn't matter that his friends were up on the roof or that the scribes doubted in their hearts. This man heard the word of Christ and immediately responded. He got up and he went home. And we saw the same thing in Abraham's life just last week. God told Abraham, you're going to leave your family. You're going to leave your country. You're going to go to a place that you don't even know where it is yet. Just obey. right? And God called and Abraham went. Do we obey immediately when God shows us his will? Now let's take a look at the end result of this interaction. This is the most important part of everything that we could learn today. God gets the glory. Through this man's humble faith, his submission, his obedience, God got the glory. Now hear me, God will always get the glory, whether through his judgment of sin or through the obedience of people that submit to him. And verse 12, once again, they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. And the people that were there had never seen anything like it before in their lives. A man came in humble faith to Christ. His sins were forgiven. And the proof of his faith and God's power was shown in his immediate obedience and physical healing as well. Even those disbelieving and proud scribes had to glorify God as the power that had done this miracle. So as they were all amazed and glorified God, right? even maybe begrudgingly, they still had to recognize that there was nothing else but the power of God that had done this. <clears throat> the scribes really didn't have any excuse at this point, and it was unlike anything from this world because it was not of this world at all. There is no power like the power of God, and it's always evident in the lives of those that are transformed by it and those who are there to witness such things. Now, people may not be feel healed physically in the same way that we see here, but the power of God is always evident in salvation. Now, each and every one of us can probably look back before we were saved and see the transformation that happened in our own lives at the point of salvation. It's an amazing transformation, and I've been privileged to see some of the folks in this very church get saved over the years, and I can say it's, it is a very evident transformation. It always is. God takes the heart. He gives them a new heart. He gives them new desires and a new will to serve him completely opposed to and completely opposite to anything that might have been there before, which is usually self-love and self-focus. It's always an evident transformation that takes place in all around, whether family or friends or acquaintances can see that change. There have been others that never showed that change in their lives, and that was also very obvious as well. God gets the glory through all of it. Now, often... We tend to overlook passages like this because we look at the miracle itself. And while that's a wonderful thing, it really misses the heart of the man who came to Christ. It misses his mindset and his submission to Christ. And really, all the, all the miracle was intended to do was just to point back to the fact that the man's sins had been forgiven. And so, we can recognize that the true miracle here was the transformation of a man's life, not externally, not through his physical healing, but internally as he sought Christ in faith. And this is so very practical for us as we look at this example. I hope it's not dry history to you. It shouldn't be. It's a living testimony in the living word that we get to learn from and apply to our lives. In summary, true faith is determined. 
True faith is rewarded by God by forgiving us of our sins and adopting us into his family. True faith is very obviously different than false faith, and true faith always brings glory to God, both in the heart and the outward obedience. Now, as we close, I'd like to bring this home and ask you very directly, where are you today? What's the condition of your heart? Are you saved? If you are, you should be obedient when you see God's truth. You should be humble like this man. You should seek to quickly respond in all areas that God shows you from his word. And if you're not saved, why not? Why not? Are you like the scribes that are coming and doubting and making excuses for the free gift of salvation that's offered to you? Are there obstacles in your life that you're making excuses for? Are you putting off obeying Christ because you happen to be proud or religious, trusting in your own works or your own self-righteousness to save you? Now I would humbly ask you all to reflect on this example and apply it to your own hearts and see if you really have the right kind of faith. The right kind of faith comes to Christ and seeks to have sins forgiven and obeys immediately. Don't put it off. Delaying is just as disobedient as rejecting God's word and if you come to church each and every week and you hear God's word and you reject it and you reject it and you harden your heart, God's not going to be able to work in your heart. There comes a time when you have no more opportunities to respond. Far more dangerous to be a part of a Christian family that comes and becomes ambivalent and complacent in God's house because you hear these things and you're part of a family that's a Christian and you become used to it rather than someone who responds immediately when they hear God's word and comes to Christ in faith. Now, we ought to be like this man. He was humble. He was submitted. He came seeking healing. God granted it. We don't even know his name. We don't know what he did after this. Hopefully he followed Christ. We do know that he had the right heart of faith. And he was completely transformed internally and externally as a result of coming to Christ with that faith. And I hope this has given you some things to think about this evening, and I hope that it was a challenge to your heart and your mind. Let's make sure that we apply these things immediately. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful that we can come and we can be here tonight. Pray that your Holy Spirit would work in each heart and each mind here, Lord, and that we would always choose to be submitted to your word, submitted to Christ, and choose to walk with you daily and follow in obedience. And Lord, if there's any heart here, any person here who's not submitted to you, who's never come to faith in Christ, who's never submitted themselves, and who's never truly uh, had the right kind of faith, I pray that you would work in their heart right now, they would recognize their need, they would submit to you, and that they would uh, come to you in faith, have your sins forgiven, Lord. pray that you would uh, work through your word as it's taught, we ask that you would bless the fellowship and the time we spend together this evening. And all these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.